Hello everyone, I'm Frank Garth with Lean Startup Company, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the show. Today's topic is using Lean to decrease youth unemployment in South Africa and beyond. And moderating the discussion is our own Executive Director of Lean Impact at Lean Startup Company, Ann Mei Chang. Our guest is CEO at Harambe Youth Accelerator, Mariana Iskander. And with that, I'll hand things off to Ann May. Hi, and welcome to the first in our new Lean Impact webcast series. My name is Ann May Chang, and I'm the Executive Director of Lean Impact at Lean Startup Company and author of Lean Impact, How to Innovate for Radically Greater Social Good. Today, I'm delighted to be here with Mariana Iskander, the CEO of Harambe Youth Accelerator in South Africa. Harambe recently received some very well-deserved recognition for their pioneering work with the prestigious Skoll Award for Social Entrepreneurship. I was lucky to spend a couple of weeks with Mariana at Harambe while researching my book and featured them as a case study. I can't think of a better guest for our first social good webcast. So welcome, thank you for joining me, Mariana. Thank you, Anne May. It's such a pleasure and a privilege. We are um, so proud to be associated with your work and with Lean Impact, and I'm excited about the conversation. Me too. Um, maybe we could start out. Um, you're down there in Johannesburg, South Africa. Um, could you start out by sharing a little bit of the background on the problem you're trying to solve there and, and why it's important? So South Africa, you know, unfortunately stands out as having one of the highest youth unemployment rates um, in the world. We are 0.8% of the world's population, yet we have 8% of the global youth unemployment um, in terms of the numbers in South Africa. But I think even bigger than that, these are problems when you think about um, societies in Africa and even really across the world that are grappling with how to make labor markets work better for young people and how to get education systems to be more responsive to what the future of work is going to need. So, so what does that mean? Like how many people is that? that, that uh, how, uh, what, what are the numbers look like in terms of youth that are unemployed? So in South Africa, um, probably the best way to understand the numbers is that um, every single year about a million young people finish school, whether they drop out or get a degree and whether that's high school, university or whatever. And then within a year, every year, only third, um, 300,000 of them find their way into either education or into employment. So two thirds or somewhere between six and 700,000 every single year are unemployed and also um, discouraged work seekers. So total, we probably have between six to 9 million young people, but the but the thing we're trying to figure out is how to start fixing that on an annual cohort basis um, so that it feels like there's going to be an answer as we as we sort of move forward year in and year out. And, and what are some of the barriers? Like, why, why is this? What, why, why are you not able to find jobs? Well, definitely there's the challenge of just not enough jobs. Our economies um, in South Africa and I would say across the African continent are not growing fast enough to generate enough jobs. And I think that's a kind of an existential challenge that we can talk about and that I think a lot of governments and societies are really grappling with. But I also think there's a lot of other barriers that stand in the way of young people finding their way to things that they can do, whether those look like proper jobs in the formal economy or even doing things in their community to generate income, um, whether it's self-employment or otherwise. I think the challenges the young people face are also really substantial. Everything from not having the information to know how and where to look for jobs, not having the educational qualifications that employers may be looking for, and also really small things like not having enough data or not having the transport money to be able to actually literally get themselves to the places that they need to go. Yeah, it's, it sounds like a huge challenge and, and incredibly important. So. So now there's Harambe Youth Accelerator. Um, uh, tell me how you got started and what, what do you guys do? So I love telling the story about how Harambe got started because it really speaks to me um, why we need the private sector and government and young people all to be part of the solution. So Harambe was really started um, by business, thinking about what their job and their role in society was and how they had a problem to solve for themselves almost as customers, which is they struggled to find enough young people in some of the um, businesses to do things like call center jobs or work in restaurants. 
And so when, when a group of businesses got together to try to say, how do we tackle this without just thinking about our own individual needs, but trying to really understand why there's like a sea of young people sort of on one side of the river and jobs and opportunities that we have on the other side of the river. And there's no bridge that is like letting us get to them or letting them get to us. And in many ways, that's really how Harumbi was started. And our logo kind of looks like a bridge because it's really that imagery of trying to get young people across to where the opportunities are. And also I think for employers to be able to see the young people and the talent that they need. That's great to hear. I mean, we hear a lot about businesses trying to do well while doing good, but these, these companies really put their money where their mouth was and made an investment. And it sounds like a really smart one to think about this, not as just solving the problem for one company, but really solving the problem for society as a whole. And I think what's really powerful is that it's made this feel like a business solution to a business problem and not a charitable cause of like funding young people when there isn't real work for them to do. And I think as you know well, and certainly I think the things we've learned from, from Lean Impact is like when you're solving a real problem, it becomes much easier to think about scalable solutions because it's a real need and it's something that a business or an organization or a customer has identified. Yeah, and one of the things I've loved since the day I learned about Harambe is just the the kind of business acumen you bring and the 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 focus that you bring to this problem of unemployment that's very business-like in some ways, even though you're a nonprofit. Um, and it's refreshing to see because you're just like trying to chase this problem down to the ends of the earth. Well, as we've learned from you, we're trying to keep falling in love with the problem and not staying in love with our solutions, which has become <laughs> a really significant motto and an important thing that our teams actually say almost every day at work. And I think having people who've come from the private, we've got such a nice mix of leadership and I think that that really helps contribute. So even though we were founded by business and definitely had government in the mix, having people who've come from all different sectors of society, youth development, all the way through to very kind of traditional private sector people, I think has helped has helped us keep that balance. Right. So, so tell me a little bit about um, what what is Harambe today? What what have you accomplished? What are, what are you doing today? So, I think the most fundamental way to describe um, where we've come from and what we're doing is we're trying to solve a young person finding an opportunity almost at the level of two individual customers, which are young people and businesses. And at that actual point, you can start to understand the bigger kind of systems challenges and how big everything sits around that. But being really focused on customers, I think is probably the right place to start. So we partner with businesses to really try to understand um, what their challenges are in terms of entry level talent, what their pipelines are, how they think about hiring. And what we've learned in that journey is there's a huge amount of advocacy to be done helping businesses think differently about how to hire young people who have very limited work experience. And some of that's just giving them new ways to measure new things that give them confidence to hire people who traditionally don't have either the educational qualifications or the prior work experience. We've now um, gone from an original founding group of five businesses to now 500 African um, private sector organizations that we've worked with, which I think has taught us a lot across a whole bunch of sectors. We then obviously work with young people who are probably, I would say, um, almost our primary customer in terms of trying to solve the problems that sit around them. And that um, has been young people that traditionally are locked out of the economy. And for us, that means they have the constraints that we understand in terms of limited money. So they don't have enough money to kind of pay for the kinds of things that help them find a job. But probably more importantly, they have really limited networks because they tend to come from communities where almost nobody's working and nobody in their household and their families are working. And really trying to understand the barriers around them has probably been um, the most important customer facing work. We've grown our network of young people. Um, today, it's sitting at about 575,000, and we have a goal of growing that to one and a half million over the next three years. Wow, and so that's really, great. yeah. So I think trying to try, I mean, those those numbers are not big enough to solve the whole problem, but they're certainly giving us um, an opportunity to learn at scale, which I think is really important. And am I remembering correctly that you've now helped over a hundred thousand youth find a job? Is that that's right? Is that yeah. Yeah, so um, 
Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because, um, it, you know, the question, the question of how big of a network to have is actually driven by how many opportunities we can give young people. And so trying to understand um, how to keep young people engaged because there's enough on offer for them has actually been one of the really important design principles of Harambee. So the idea is to keep growing the number of opportunities. So as you've said, it's 100,000 jobs and work experiences so far, um, so that one day soon, and we think hopefully in the next three to five years, one out of every two or one out of every three people in the network will be able to, to find an opportunity. That's great. And, and recently, you've also expanded beyond South Africa to Rwanda. Is that right? Yeah, it's been a real journey of trying to understand if the things we're learning in South Africa have relevance in other countries. And I think, again, um, the ways of working are probably the things that we've seen have the most relevance, being very demand focused and focused on where the jobs are and not just being focused on the training. Partnering with governments right at the outset has been critical um, success factor for us in Rwanda. But we're also learning, I mean, Rwanda and South Africa are very different economies and look very different on the demand side. I would actually argue that the young people have a lot in common, and I think that that's been a really interesting journey. So we've adapted some parts of our model, and we're learning in Rwanda things that are going to help us in South Africa in terms of teaching English more quickly and working with young people in more informal, um, informal sectors. That's great. So um, if you don't mind, I'd love to rewind a bit and go back to the earliest days of Harambe and when you first got, got started and when you were really trying to figure out this model. Um, can you share some of the earliest experiments that you ran and, and the, the, some of the early learnings that you had as you were trying to find your way? Sure, I joined Harambe in, in its second year. So I was around for some of this and some of this preceded me, but I feel like there's three experiments, um, some by accident, that have, I think really shaped where we've come to and, and where we've grown. So the first was the idea of actually working through others from at the beginning. So when Harambe started, it had one person and then it worked through other organizations, both consultants and other partners. And I think that the, um, the real lesson learned there is to understand what the core strengths of Harambe were going to be and where we didn't actually have to be good at everything. And so we brought consultants that helped us design our behavior change model and like what it would take for young people to really be work ready. Um, and that has really stuck with us as a method of working, which is what are we gonna be really good at and what do we rely on other people to be really good at? And that's, I think, been an important part of, um, part of scaling. I think a second thing that we learned a little bit by accident is that um, we started feeding young people before they wrote their tests. And I know that that sounds like so simple, but I think a lot of um, the, our biggest insights are actually sometimes from the simplest things. And um, just by giving fruit and peanut butter sandwiches, we saw that young people's scores on assessments that were really important because these were the things employers were gonna look at in terms of deciding who to hire, went up by about 30%. And I think that kind of insight for some of our employer partners has also been a real wake up call it's like such the obvious fact that when people are hungry, they actually can't perform on tests at a level that really demonstrates their true potential. Um, and so we've made about 2 million peanut butter sandwiches at Harambe since our <laughs> founding day. And, and we think of that as really one of the, the biggest ahas and, and most important and biggest insights. And some of our employers now feed people before they give them tests in their own environments. And, and a, good, a good example of where advocacy, I think, has expanded some of our learnings to others. Probably the one that I think has been um, the most powerful, um, both in terms of what it says about the change that's needed and also about the amazing potential of young people is that in South Africa, and I think this is true in lots of other places, we often give people a math test as part of the hiring process. And that's, um, I think, rests on flawed logic that somehow giving somebody a math test is gonna tell you whether they can pro solve problems or think logically or, you know, have th um, a ways of conceptual thinking when in fact all a math test does is measure whether anybody taught you math well. And because the quality of our schooling system is so poor, and in fact, one of the, we have probably the lowest kind of math education levels, um, certainly in Africa, and I think in the lowest um, quintile in the world. If you give these young people a math test, I can just guarantee they're gonna fail and then they're not gonna be in the kind of pipeline to get the job. And so we tried to take a different take and say, can we measure what the young person's ability to do the job is, which is um, acquiring new information, 
thinking about how to apply it, actually trying to measure for things like problem solving um, and fluid intelligence. And so we started doing this other assessment called learning potential, which measures, can I take in new information and can I apply it? And we saw something really amazing, which is that a vast majority of the young people had the learning potential for the job, what employers needed, but still failed the math test. And so really teaching employers how to look for different things and how to measure different things that are about future potential to do the job, not just measuring the quality of, of poor education has been a massive game changer because we've been able to really get young people with, with the ability to actually perform in jobs, despite the fact that they've really been failed by their poor schooling and their poor maths education. That's great. And so, uh, as I understand it, Harambe takes, um, identifies youth based on their potential and then helps uh, to bridge that gap, right? That, that you, you actually teach the skills that the youth are, are potentially didn't get in, in school. Yes, and because they have the learning potential, we can do that more quickly than sending them back to school. So our training um, programs are really designed to be fit for purpose for whatever the skills are that the young people need. So if they are going to go into a retail environment, they need to learn how to stand on their feet. And so that's actually what we do with them. If they're going to go into a bank or a call center environment, they may need other kinds of skills like rapid typing or literacy or numeracy. And that's the kinds of uh, bridging and, and training programs we run. That's great. And so, and you talked about Harambe's really operates a two-sided marketplace that you're both trying to solve problems for youth and you're also trying to solve problems for employers. So uh, you mentioned now that you work with um, over 500 employers. So what, what's the value proposition to employers? What is the problem you're solving for them and why do they come to Harambe? Well, really, there's, there's probably uh, two or three reasons. They definitely come if they're having some kind of a human capital or hiring challenge. They can't find the people they need. Now, sometimes that's because there's not enough. So there's scarcity and there's just not enough of what they need. Sometimes they have such high attrition and such high turnover that they really can't figure out why people aren't staying. And so the value proposition to the employers in those cases is really to solve for that. Can we find a better match so that somebody is more likely to both succeed in the interview, but more importantly, stay in the job. And so certainly trying to understand how both retention for the employer and sustainability for the young person um, is really possible and maximized is a big part of it. Because similarly for young people, finding an opportunity for them isn't enough. If they can't get the job, they can't win the interview. And we focus actually a lot on how to win the interview um, and then be able to stay in the job. I think the one thing, and we measure, um, I mean, we do measure retention kind of as an aggregate across all the jobs that we've done. And at the six month mark, it's a, at about 90%. And then at the 12 month mark, um, it's at about 76%, which is really great compared to like kind of sector averages and, and a lot of individual employers own statistics. It is, however, important to say we have to get employers to be good employers because they are the they are the reason that people will stay in the job longer than Harambi. And so really partnering with them and doing a lot of change management with them has been has been critical for those kinds of retention rates. And, and so you're really providing um, value to employers by saving them money at the end of the day, right? That if they have to interview fewer people in order to find employer employees that will match their needs and if their employees stay for long and they're not having to go through this constant churn, that saves them real money at the end of the day. Yeah, um, and I mean, it, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, sorry, go ahead. I was gonna say, and then they pay for that. And that's a really important part of the model is that this isn't like a free service to employers because they have to see value in it as solving yeah. a real a real business need for them. And I think that having employers pay for the service has been a really important part of demonstrating that this is like highly value add and market responsive. And to your point, really saving them time, energy and, and money at the end of the day. Right, and, and it's also important for the youth, right? Retention is also a really important factor for youth to be put, to put them on a successful path for their futures, is that right? It is. I mean, one of the things I think we're learning more recently is that we, you know, I think as, as the economy is changing and permanent jobs are becoming a thing of the past, is sustainability may not look like I have the same job for the next five years because employers are not necessarily running their operations in that way. 
but what does sustainability mean in terms of going from one opportunity to the next opportunity and not falling back out of unemployment? And so even though we are seeing certainly with the gig economy and all the disruptions of technology in a lot of the sectors in which we work, we're trying to get more focused on how young people retain in the economy, even if they don't necessarily stay in the same job um, for an extended period of time. Mm -hmm. So, so given the importance of retention, both for employers and for the youth, how do, how do you go about tracking retention? You cited these great numbers of retention rates at six months or 12 month rates. A lot of the organizations I know that work on youth unemployment don't have those kind of numbers. How do you get them? Well, we definitely try to stay in touch with employers and that ought to feel like the easiest way to track it. But surprisingly, employers don't always actually have the best information and it's certainly not their job to tell us who's staying all the time. And so we've really pivoted um, recognizing that young people are the customer that we're gonna rely on the most and that we really need to be on an employment journey with them. So we have a survey that's called My Employment Journey and that goes to the young people in our network every three months. And it gives us an opportunity to really ask them a series of questions about whether they've been promoted, what are they earning, what's happening in their lives in terms of the um, job that they're in. And we use that data, not just for our own reporting, but also to help think about what might come next for them. And that's been a big pivot in terms of these SMS messages and really low cost ways of, of trying to get information back so that we can provide more opportunities for those young people. Mm -hmm. So uh, given that retention is so core to your model, you have great ways to measure it. Um, what are some of the things that you've learned along the way um, and some of the pivots you, you've made in your model in order to improve retention? You started talking a little bit about the, um, you know, the, the youth that are working in retail stores and, and uh, some of the things you did there. Can, can you share more about that and some of the other things you've done? Sure, so we've been able to really identify um, an employability map. So you can imagine sort of a, a map in your head and it has six different kind of um, stations or hubs or, or parts of it. And those are the factors of employability that we've learned really matter and some matter more than others. So for example, if you're working in a retail environment or a hospitality environment, probably the most important factor is where you live and can you afford to get to work on the salary that you're earning. And so one big aha that we had in the early days was how to really understand sourcing young people from no more than one taxi ride away from the job. So it's like dropping a pin at the store where they're going to work and making sure that one taxi was going to be able to get them to work so that they could keep the job really. And, and we've learned that as a, as a big insight. We've also learned that sometimes behaviors matter a lot more than skills in terms of educational qualifications. And exactly the example I was giving before is that Young people who have not worked just don't know what to expect. And so they have no idea what the job is about. So if I'm gonna arrive at a job where I stand on my feet for eight days, for eight hours a day or 10 hours, I have to know that that's what I'm signing up for and I have to be able to demonstrate that I can do that. And so instead of having a training program where you show up at 9 a.m. and you sit at a desk and you take lots of notes, you have to have something that really gives you the right expectation. You come at five because that's when work starts. You stand on your feet and then at night you can decide I, I can do this or you can decide to opt out. And I think really a lot of these um, innovations are about giving young people the dignity of choice and letting them decide. Now that Harumbi has told me what this job is, I got to decide that I'm really up for it and that I really want to do it. And as you can imagine, that's a pretty virtuous cycle because then the employer is more likely to get a young person who really understands what's expected, really knows that they can do it, and I think really kind of um, retain themselves and, and be able to stay and succeed in that job. That's great. And, and you, you got to some of these insights by looking at the data. Is that right? That you looked at retention data and saw where things where their the retention rates weren't as high as you thought they needed to be. Sir. Yeah. And, and talking to young people. I mean, so when you begin to understand, certainly, from employers like why did this person not stay and then you call the young person and say what happened and then they explain to you I literally didn't have enough money to make it to the first paycheck in terms of covering my transport I remember a young man named Vincent who lived um, in the northern part of Johannesburg and um, used to walk to work I mean across a very large city 
until he got his first paycheck in order to be able to afford the taxi fare. And when you help an employer understand that they are like as horrified as we are because it would not have occurred to them that they would have hired somebody who didn't have the kind of cushion to get them to a first paycheck. And what that does is open up a lot of really creative ways for employers to start solving those kinds of problems. So it was a lot of, a lot of iterative asking the employer, asking the young person, asking the employer, asking the young person. And I think a lot of the insights were really generated um, in that way. Yeah, and, and I think as I remember you, um, what you found was that as you're seeing, digging into some of the reasons for attrition that um, a lot of the youth just weren't able to pay for transportation, that they would run out of money to pay for transportation to get to their jobs before they got their first paycheck. Is not that's all of them exactly. were willing to walk across the city. No, that's exactly right. So, I mean, Vincent was, what we don't want are more people walking all the way across the city when an employer can definitely solve for that problem. And so we've seen really creative solutions, giving people either an advance on the first paycheck, coming up with other creative models. But our job is to try to make sure, again, for particularly the lower complexity or the jobs that don't pay as much, that you can afford it on the, on the income that you're gonna earn. Um, and so those, those insights have really taken us, uh, taken us far, and now we're using technology um, to get even smarter about how to look at the data. That's great. And I love the story, I think, you, you, as, as you develop these insights about how important transport, you know, access, accessibility is from a transportation standpoint for retention. You also discover that there are some places where there just wasn't economic activity within um, within reasonable transport, um, such as a place called Orange Farm. Uh, can you share a little bit um, sort of the pivot you took there? Sure. So I think one of the real challenges that we've, um, we've learned from is how to find opportunities for young people, as you said, in, in areas and communities where there's just not a lot of businesses, there's not a lot of economic activity. Um, Orange Farm is a um, township that is to the south of Joburg, um, where young people really, it would be impossible to afford the kind of taxi fare to go in and out of Johannesburg for, for these kinds of jobs. And so we, um, we had a really interesting idea because we were working at the time with a cruise ship company that was looking to put young people onto cruise ships. And the team originally thought, well, we should do that in a city next to the sea. And then the really, the kind of light bulb went off and said, well, why don't we actually get these kids onto a ship because then they don't need taxi money to get to work. They're already going to be sort of living, living where they need to work. And, and that was a creative solution. I know. And I think really it, it does try to, um, I think it does try to, it speaks to the idea of like, let's, let's think outside the normal, um, the normal instincts that we might have about what's possible. And in this case, it, it took many hurdles to get the young people from Orange Farm actually onto a ship. So the first was they had to learn how to pass a swimming test. Now, I can tell you in Orange Farm, they don't know how to swim. So we had to build a bridge and hire a trainer and we used the pool from the city and figured that out. They then had to um, do a fire and safety, which was a whole different piece. And then the, the last piece, which we really was a big aha for us, is they all had to pass a, a medical exam because, as, as you know, on a ship, there's no hospitals nearby. And so you really have to be able to demonstrate a level of fitness to get you onto the ship. And in the very first group, almost two thirds of the young people failed the medical. So we were like, what happened here? And in the spirit of asking questions and digging into the data, when we looked at it, most of them had failed the medical for kind of poverty related health reasons. So nutrition, the quality of their teeth, eyesight, things that actually were very fixable. And so that began a real advocacy journey with the medical doctor actually in the employer to say, if we can get this stuff sorted out, surely we can find a way for these guys to kind of tick the boxes on the medical. And so then we got into the business of trying to figure out how the health departments in Orange Farm understood that these are the things that were important for kids to get jobs and tried to solve the problem that way. I actually have a picture on my phone today of a young man from the Eastern Cape, which is another part of South Africa, also very little economic activity. And he sent a message to say, first flight, first job, he's flying to Miami today to get onto one of these ships and, and begin his career in the cruise line business. That's wonderful. So when we, when we think about helping youth get employment and, and trying to build skills, we often think about training them in, you know, kind of 
I don't know, uh, math skills and, yeah. and soft skills and so forth, but you're, you're branching out and actually giving swimming lessons. <laughs> yeah, which is or, or eye lessons or needed. whatever. Yeah, whatever's, whatever's needed is actually the right, whatever the job needs is, is the motto. Uh-huh, that's great. Um, one of the things that I was most impressed with the first time I um, visited Harambe was just how much you guys are focused on data, which is not something that's as common in the nonprofit world as it is in the business world. And I remember seeing scorecards plastered on, on the walls of your hallways, kind of, I think, showing the progress of each of your youth through the bridges and, and how they were doing. Um, can you tell me a little bit about that and how did data become so integral to, to your work there? Well, I think that the, the kind of founding principles of Harambi put that in from day one. So some of that was having kind of a private sector orientation just around we need to measure what we're doing. But I actually think it was also the need to, to use government and public funding responsibly. And I think that that's actually been a key driver of we have to find kind of cost effective and cost efficient ways to do this because even if we're going to think big and start small, we know that the problem is like really, really significant. And so data for us has been like the core of how to design programs, how to measure the value of interventions. And while that's been at the core, the iteration of changing based on the data, I think has probably been what you experienced in the hallways, which is the scorecards change. So as we learn what other things to measure, we got to start adding different dimensions. Different teams think very differently if I think about the, the, the teams that work with young people, we measure ourselves on net promoter score. Do the young people say that they've had a quality experience for us? Our call center, which provides a lot of services now on the phone to young people, measure not just the traditional average handling time or like kind of normal call center metrics, but how many lives did I impact that day in the conversations that I had? And so it's really trying to help every part of our business understand that we're impacting lives and we have to demonstrate the value of that in the most cost effective and impactful way using data. I also think data has been a real strength in terms of getting people to change their minds. We are in the business of changing people's minds about this group of young people, about how they hire, about go how governments fund training programs. And if you don't have data, it's not really gonna, it's gonna be a lot harder, I think, to get big institutions to really think very differently. Yeah, I, I think that's so important. Um, and it, um, as you think about, uh, as you look forward, and, and I think you, you've already been quite successful, but you're not resting on your laurels, you're still quite ambitious. Um, how, how, how do you think about getting to scale? Like, um, what does that look like in terms of the funding sources and the, um, the ability to get your model to 10 times as many people or 100 times as many uh, youth in the future? Yeah. So, I mean, there's probably three different things. So one, which is, I mean, I think everybody says it, but it is actually true, which is how do you really use technology to reduce the costs for everybody? And actually for us, reducing the cost for the young person is the organizing kind of principle of our interventions. And so obviously we wanna reduce our own costs, but when a young person doesn't have to travel in a taxi and pay whatever that is to get something that we can deliver on the phone, we can deliver through a partner in the community, we can do something that really reduces kind of the burden and the costs on them. And so we've been using a lot of different channels. So I've mentioned the contact center um, where we make a huge amount of outbound calls to deliver assessments. We actually deliver calls for interest. We deliver some information that an employer might have had you come in for. We can deliver to you on a phone call that you don't have to pay for. And so I definitely think technology and its full kind of um, embodiment of channels has been really critical. The second is really thinking about how to show cost effectiveness so that more government money gets directed to things that actually work. And I think mm -hmm. that that's, I think that, that for us, that's going to be an important part of scale is governments don't have new money. So you got to give them ideas of how to spend the existing money better. And I think that training, the effectiveness of training programs, thinking about how to reduce data costs, thinking about vouchers to help young people with transport, these like micro barriers that get in the way of it really working in terms of, of connections in the labor market. So I, I think technology, I think efficiency to drive more funding. And I definitely think getting more partnerships that, that problem solve at beyond the individual kind of company. 
getting sectors to start thinking about how to, they can do things together. Um, and it's not just about me, it's about the recognition that if I don't think bigger, I'm never gonna solve my own business problem. I think those are the things that we're starting to see are really working. That's great, that's, that's fantastic. And I, and I love the scale of your ambitions. Um, one of the, the challenges I hear from many of the nonprofits I talk to um, when thinking about using lean startup or lean impact approaches is funding, that um, f funders um, often can be fairly prescriptive, want a kind of plan that's defined well in advance and that you are executing on. Um, I'm, I'm curious if you could share some of your experience of, you know, how has, uh, how has funding been, been a challenge? Or do you, have you encountered some of those uh, constraints and, and how have you gotten around them? It really speaks to what we were just saying. I think when you are very data driven, it becomes much easier to help funders maybe think about different models and different ways of funding. And so I think that in many respects, just focusing on data and focusing on evidence has helped us be able to change what I think are traditional kind of funder paradigms of needing to know things in five years time that you don't even know how they're going to happen tomorrow or the next week. And you have to build that trust on a base of evidence and on a base of, of data. Otherwise, I think it's hard. The other thing which sounds a little bit counterintuitive, and I know it's probably hard for organizations that need money, sometimes taking the wrong kind of funding is just going to send you so off course, it's not even worth doing. And I think that those are the kinds of really hard conversations and trade-offs that work. If you know that what you're doing is the right way to do it, but a funder wants you to go left instead of go right, it's like keep trying to find the funder who's going to help you go right, because if you go left, it's going to be really hard to like switch directions. And I think that that has been, and again, that's, I don't mean that in a glib way because I know how hard fundraising is, but I also think that what happens is then you attract the kind of people that can see that you have belief in the methods that you have right. backed and, and done. And the, you know, we, we, we uh, wrote a blog for, for the Lean Startup on the work we've done in Rwanda. And it was an opportunity to say to a funder, we have no idea what the outcomes are gonna be of this particular program. And you gotta sort of trust us and we're gonna be in everyday iteration and change. And again, because I think we have been trying to focus on data and evidence, we just were able to build the trust to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. Speaking of that example in Rwanda, can you share a little bit more about that? I know you recently wrote this blog post and I think it's, it, it's a fascinating story if you can talk about this process of figuring out how to help um, your, the youth in Rwanda improve their English skills. I love telling the story because it's like one of the coolest things that has happened at Arumbi in the, in the last year. So um, in Rwanda, the schooling system switched basically overnight from French to English and obviously um, Kenya Rwanda is the language that, um, that most young Rwandans speak. And the result of that is like how to accelerate English in a country where increasingly more jobs are requiring young people to speak English. And so we, we, we had met with employers, started on the demand side as we always do. And basically every employer in Rwanda was like, speaking English is one of the biggest challenges that we have in finding the talent that we need. The first thing that we did is we said, let's not try to solve every part of English. Reading, writing, speak, we can't solve everything all at once. We're just trying to figure out how to get young people to converse and have better spoken English. And so it was really also just trying to zero in on like, what is the exact problem that needs to get solved and not try to boil the ocean and solve every problem. We then said, most English programs are very long. So two years or three years. And typically the content, to be honest, is like super boring. So the dog walked across the street or I saw the cat in the shade. And it's really hard for people to get energized in terms of doing that repeatedly for hours and hours every day. And so in our search for models across the world, one of our colleagues on a flight to Rwanda was reading Lean Impact. And in Lean Impact, she saw that there was an organization in the United States called Revolution English that had been innovating ways of getting immigrants in America to speak English more quickly. So we, thanks to you, got in touch with them and were able to really try to understand from their model what they did differently. And we walked away with two really big insights. The first is, if you want people to learn something, they have to be like hooked by the kind, it has to just be interesting. That's really the only way to have, a, and we needed a lot of self-directed learning. So we ended up asking young people what TV series or what sitcom they would want to watch. And 
they all picked friends. And so we ended up designing this bridge where they spent hours every day listening, speaking, talking about friends. And that definitely was the magic trick. It helped them do things and immerse themselves in language. And in a short four week period, we saw a really rapid um, improvement in their spoken English. That's fantastic. I love that story as well. Um, and it's great to see like two of the case studies from the book sort of cross fertilizing with each other. Well, I think the more we can find organizations that think about the leanest way to get things done and to try things and not be afraid to change, I actually think will make a much bigger impact in the social sector. And also just to be willing to learn from other organizations. I think a lot of times we all feel like we have to reinvent the wheel, that that's part of, you know, what a lot of nonprofits do. And so I think it's great that you're adopting a model that's shown to be successful elsewhere. Um, as we wind down, I, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about some of the more innovative funding models that you're using, again, as you're getting to more scale. I think you're starting to look at things like pay for success models and social impact bonds. Can you talk about your experiences there? Sure. I think one of the things that we've definitely learned is that we've got, as I was saying earlier, we've got to spend the existing money better because people don't have new money, either businesses and definitely not governments. And I think what happens in a lot of places is we all um, pay for the training and then kind of hope that it works. And I think that the idea of really being focused on inputs without any real ability to control what happens at the end of the training is the shift we're trying to make in the system. So we are um, a year and a half into a four year um, initiative to try to test the pay for performance model. And so it's an impact bond in its form, but what it's really trying to do is say, can we find a way for government really to pay when the young person gets the job as opposed to pay for the training and then again, have no recourse if nobody gets the job. And that's really been an eye-opening journey because that sounds like such an obvious concept, but there are so many hard things about getting it to work. And certainly in Harumbi's case, trying to partner with other organizations to be operators so that it's not just us doing the delivery, which is gonna be an important part of scale. So being able to say to other organizations, like if you know that at the end of your training, you can get young people into jobs because what you're doing is what the market needs, we will pay you and we will raise the money to be able to help you um, do that. And it's critical for scale because we definitely cannot do all this, the delivery ourselves and we need to find mm -hmm. models that will help others. So we're learning a lot. And I think it's definitely getting a lot of our partners to start just thinking differently about how the money in the system can be used to achieve the outcomes that we all want. That's great. So where would you like to be to see Harambe in 20 years time? What, what, what's your aspiration for what success looks like? Okay, 20 years is a long time from now. So if I start small, I will say that we are um, trying to by 2025, which is five years from now, really get to a model that can on an annual basis, get all the young people that are falling out of the education and schooling system in South Africa. So grow our network by five to 600,000 every year and find enough opportunities, as I was saying, um, for, for a lot of the young people in that network. By 2030, our government has said that, they, um, that 11 million new jobs are gonna need to be created as kind of the national planning. I think that Arumbi can play a big role in providing kind of a network and a pathway system for that to, to feel possible. We are in Rwanda, as you, um, as you said. And I think probably the best way to, to say in 20 years what my hope and dream is, is that you know, there's a billion young Africans that are gonna need a pathway to something. I mean, that's like a really big, scary number. And I definitely have no idea how to deliver a billion of anything to those young people. But I actually think that if we can get this right, we can help enough African governments and enough countries think about how to do this differently that in, in the next 20 years, we might be able to start bending the curve on this generation of young people that are looking up and trying to figure out how they're gonna make sense of labor markets that, 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 that are not responding to them. Wow, well, I sure hope to see that day. And um, thank you again so much for sharing your story, your time so generously with us. Um, I'm always, just so inspired when I hear about the work that you're doing uh, there in South Africa. And uh, I, th I hope our audience has really enjoyed hearing your story as well and can learn from it. Um, so 
Thank you, Mariana. Thank you to the audience for tuning in. Um, if you'd like to learn more about how to use Lean Startup uh, principles for social good, check out the social good section of the Lean Startup blog or pick up a copy of my book, Lean Impact. And we'll see you next time.